Right, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 4 in the textbook of Sengel and Gijar, the fifth edition. We are busy with uh, transient heat conduction. We've completed the first part of the chapter, which was on 4.1, which is the lump system analysis. The lump system analysis is the simplest way of making a first order calculation. Uh, so it's very simple and quick, especially if you compare it to the type of calculations that we're going, we going to do in this chapter. So it's very simple. But its limitations are, or is, that inside the, bo inside the body, it cannot give you the temperatures at different positions. So the temperature that you calculate is the temperature right through the body. Now normally that is not accurate, except for cases where the geometries are very small and you've got a high thermal conductivity. In those types of bodies, the lump system method works very well. So to determine if we can use the lump system analysis, we calculate the characteristic length, which is the volume divided by uh, the surface area, and then we use that in the calculation of the build number. If the build number is less than 0.1, then it's a good indication that we may use the lump system analysis. The next part of the work was a very boring lecture, and that was the previous lecture, which is on transient heat conduction in large plane walls, long cylinders and spheres with spatial effects. In that lecture, we've looked at how uh, an analytical solution can be obtained for a plain wall uh, and uh, the results are summarized in table 4.1 in your textbook. So in table 4.1 it gives you the three different types of geometries, the plain wall, the cylinder and the sphere. It gives you the solution as well as the roots of lambda. Now take note in the equation, it says from n equal to 1 to infinite, which means you have to go and do the calculation for 1, 2, 3, etc. So in the old days, when the students would speak in class, then the professor will decide, no, you have to go and do this calculation for n equal 1 to 10. But I don't hate you, so I'm not going to do that to you. Okay? So it is a lot of work. Now, fortunately, Fortunately, they have found that if tau is larger than 0.2, what is tau again? Tau is the non-dimensionalized time. If you go back to the previous table, here at the bottom there's a fine print and I'm going to refer to it a lot. So it tells you there how to calculate tau, how to calculate the build number, etc. So you don't need to remember this stuff. Now for tau larger than 0.2, they have found that you only have to calculate the first term. And if you calculate the first term, then I think, uh, if I remember correctly, the error would be less than 2%. And in engineering, in general, we can live with errors less than, 0 point, uh, less than 2%. So it means that this long equation becomes simpler, but take note, there's the so-called basal functions of the first, of the zeroth order and the first order. Uh, the values, this is a very small, but the build numbers are given there in your textbook in table 4.2. Then it gives for a plain wall, it gives the values of lambda and A, as well as for a cylinder and a sphere. And here are the basal functions, all summarized there. Then we can also, there's another very simplified case, and that is the cases, and that is actually cases where we, in, in general, we uh, we, we want to know a lot, and that is to calculate the temperature at the center. If we want to do the calculation at the center, then x is equal to zero, or r is equal to zero, then we end up with a cos of zero, it is equal to one, and then the, that long term, the sum of n equal to one, blah, 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 etc., becomes a very simple equation. There's the results. Okay? So that was the theory that we did. Oh, and I also forgot, and we also looked at the Eisler charts. Typically look like that, 
take note, there's the geometry. Every time for the plane wall, it tells you where you must, where L is, where two L is, and then uh, you get the charts also. There are uh, four charts, uh, sorry, three charts. The first one you, you use to determine the temperatures at the center. The second one is when you want to calculate the temperature somewhere else. And the third one gives you the heat transfer. Okay. Then you've got the same type of charts for the cylinder and uh, the, the sphere. So, now with all this theory, let's look at a typical example so that we can get a little bit of exercises and practice in terms of how we should apply this theory and these tables and calculations which looks actually very complicated. And the example that we're going to do is that of a dead body. Okay. So somebody was murdered. Okay. okay. Now when they came to the body, uh, they measured the temperature at the center so the temperature at the center was measured as 25 degrees Celsius. Normally they take a thermometer and they put it into the liver and then they take the measurement in the liver, approximately in the center. Now if you look at the three different geometries that we have derived so far and you must choose one then we're going to make an engineering assumption and say, well, it's sort of a cylinder. Okay. So the person is sort of a cylinder, and his, average, his length is about 1.7 meters. So 1,700 millimeters, and his diameter, on average, about 300 millimeters. 300 millimeters. What we also know is that most human beings, if you're not extremely sick or something like that, then, uh, then uh, your initial temperature would be 37 degrees Celsius. Before you were murdered, or before the person was more murdered, his temperature would have been about 37 degrees Celsius. Now they've measured the environment temperature an estimate that over the past that it was quite constant and let's say it was about 20 degrees Celsius. The heat transfer coefficient was estimated to be about 8 watts per square meter degree Celsius. That is a typical value for natural convection. In chapter 1 in your, in your textbook you've looked at the three different modes of heat transfer and in convection heat transfer you get natural convection and forced convection and typically for natural convection the heat transfer coefficients would be approximately in that order. So, now the question would of course be how many hours ago were the person murdered? Because then it's a very important part of trying to figure out who murdered the person, isn't it? So how many hours ago? Right, now if, you, if you've looked at uh, uh, the equations that we've derived so far, you would have seen that there's d some detail in it that we need to put in of the, of the body. For example, the density, the thermal conductivity, etc. And you all have the textbook, and one of the very important things that you need to know is to know how to use that textbook. It's like thermodynamics. You know the tables there at the back. If you never use them, and if you suddenly have to use them in a test or exam, it is very easy to make a mistake. So I would really like to encourage you to really start making use of your textbook. So for those of you who've got your textbook here, it would be a good thing to take it out, because I want you to get the properties for me for a dead person. Well, what properties will you use? So what properties will you use for a body? 
a human being, the thermal conductivity, the density, etc. The values that we're going to need is the thermal conductivity, the density, the CP, and the alpha value, the thermal diffusivity. Those are the four that most probably we're going to use. So for those of you with your textbook, you can look at the back. In the back there are tables, typically in Appendix A. There are appendices there, and there you can get the properties of gases, liquids, and solids, typically. I'm going to help you because if you look at it and go through it, you'll see there is nowhere the properties of a human being. Okay. Or of a chicken or a pig or anything else that you can use. But we know that about 80% of a human being is water. So it would be a good assumption to say, well, let's use the properties of water. Okay. So if you go to table A9, so we're going to say water properties. And if you go to table A9, you'll get the properties of water. However, if you can tell me what is the thermal, thermal conductivity of the thermal conductivity of water, what would your answer be? You will ask me at what temperature, because you will see the thermal properties is a function of temperature. And you'll see it a lot in this module. What we're going to do is we're going to use what we call a bulk temperature, which is sort of an average. So the bulk temperature would be the initial temperature, which was 37, plus the temperature when the body was found, was 25 divided by 2. So we need the properties at about 31 degrees Celsius. Again, in your table, you'll see most probably there are properties at 30 and 40, or 30 and 35. In the test and exam, you can choose the, the, um, the one that is nearest. So you do not have to do linear interpolation in the test or exam, because it wastes too much, too much time. But I've got a, a nice computer program that I use to do the, uh, to determine the properties for me. And according to that program, the properties for thermal conductivity is equal to 0.716 watts per meter Kelvin. The density rho is equal to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. The CP value is equal to 4178 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And alpha, the thermal diffusivity, is equal to K divided by rho CP. You can calculate it from that. Or write it like this, it's equal to 1.477 multiplied by 10 to the minus 7 square meters per second. Okay, so there's the properties. So which approach are we now going to use to determine the time of death? We've got the lump system approach, paragraph 4.1, and in paragraph 4.2, we have done the derivations for the plane wall, the cylinder, the long cylinder, and a sphere. Well, just to do an illustration, I'm going to do it both ways. Okay. However, if you look at this, and if you think back of the lump system approach, then we've said that in general, that approach works very well if the bodies are small and if the thermal conductivity is high. The body is not small, and the thermal conductivity is not high. Okay. 0.6 is, is small. High thermal conductivity is 200, 300, etc. for metals. But let's go and do it just to see. So the lump system approach says that you have to go and calcula calculate the characteristic length which is equal to the volume of the body divided by the surface area. The body of the volume is pi divided by 4 
d square multiplied by its length. Okay? And the surface area is pi dl. Pi dl will be this area here on the outside. Okay? But we also have this area on this side and that side. Okay? So plus 2 times pi divided by 4 d squared d squared. So that is how we're going to calculate the characteristic length. If you go and put the diameter and the length in it, then you can determine the characteristic length to be equal to 0 0.0689 meters. Now you can calculate the build number. The build number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the characteristic length divided by the thermal conductivity. The heat transfer coefficient, the average heat transfer coefficient on the outside of the body is 8. The characteristic length is equal to 0 0.0689 divided by the thermal conductivity which is equal to 0 0.617 and it gives us a build number of equal to 0.89. Okay. So, the build number is not smaller than 0.1. So therefore we, should, therefore we should know that the lump system approach is not going to be accurate. Okay, so the lump system approach is not going to be accurate. But we are curious. Let's go and see what it will estimate. Okay, so according to the lump system approach theta, the non-dimensionalized temperature is equal to the temperature minus T infinite divided by Ti minus T infinite is equal to E to the minus Bt. Okay. Where B is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by rho the volume Cp. The heat transfer coefficient is 8, the surface area pi dl plus 2 times, four, 2 times pi divided by 4 divided by d squared divided by the density 1000, the volume pi 4 divided by d squared divided by l divided by cm or you can write this as the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by Rho LCCP. Okay. Because the characteristic length is the volume divided by the surface area. And if you go and calculate it, it would be equal to 2.778 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5 per second. Are you all with me? Any questions? Yep. I beg your pardon? <coughs> the build the number? Yeah. The heat transfer coefficient is in, uh, has a unit degree Celsius, but yeah. then um, the thermal conductivity has right. Kelvin. Yes. The, okay, so a question that comes up actually quite a lot is in terms of units. So, uh, in terms of units, 0.617 watts per meter Kelvin. And also the heat transfer coefficients, which are t typically 8 watts per square meter Kelvin. Okay. It's exactly the same as 0.617 watts per meter degree Celsius. And also it's exactly the same as 8 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. In convective heat transfer, if you look at convective heat transfer, is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area multiplied by temperature difference. Okay. If you go and do this 
Uh, let's suppose this is in degree Celsius. So this is the heat transfer coefficient. As, uh, yeah. okay, let's suppose it's 1,000 Watt. It's equal to the heat transfer coefficient. Let's suppose the surface area is 2 and your temperature is 100 minus that of the environment is 20. Then you can go and calculate the heat transfer coefficient. I don't know. How much is it? Somebody can calculate it six quickly. I'm going to just say x, the value. Watts per square meter, degree Celsius. Degree Celsius because you've used degree Celsius. However, if you go and use, do this calculation with Kelvin, then it's 273 plus 100 okay, in Kelvin, minus 273 plus 20 in Kelvin. So the result is the same value, Watts per square meter Kelvin. Exactly the same. Okay. So in convective heat transfer, we can use Kelvin or degree Celsius. It doesn't matter. You'll see it in the units also all the time. You only have to be careful when you get to radiation. When you get to radiation, you always work in Kelvin <laughs> because there it's very important. Okay. But in convective heat transfer, it doesn't matter. Right. So um, let's go back to this calculation, we've calculated the value of B now, so now we can go and calculate how long, it, how long ago the murder took place. The temperature was now measured as 25, 25 minus the environment temperature is 20. Initially the body was at 37. The environment temperature is 20. Again, as you, if you look at it, you can do it in Kelvin or degree Celsius. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same answer. It's equal to E to the minus B, which is equal to 2.778, multiplied by 10 to the minus 5. T. T is the only unknown. And T can then be calculated as 44,047 seconds. If you divide it by 60, you get it in minutes. If you divide it by another 60, you get it in hours. So that works out as 12.24 hours before the temperature was measured as 25 degrees Celsius in the center of the body. Okay? Does that make sense? Right, now let's see if we now can use the more sophisticated approach, which should be more accurate, and that is to make use of the approach in paragraph 4.2, where we look at the plane walls, the cylinder, and the sphere. And we've already made the assumption that this body is that of a cylinder. <coughs> Therefore, if we go back to table 4.1 that summarizes the three solutions to us, there's a solution for plain wall, there's a solution for the cylinder, there's a solution for the sphere, as well as the roots. And if you look at it, you'll see that everything depends on alpha and the build number. And then there are also values of A1 in it. Okay. And as I've mentioned already, take note of the fine print below. So there are special cases, and the special cases if, is if tau is larger than 0.2, then we only have to use the first calculation of n equal to 1. And if we want to make another assumption, and we are specifically looking for the temperatures in the center, then the equation becomes even more simple. Okay. But getting the value of A1 and lambda 1, I don't know if you can see it, for those of you who can't, if you can look in your, in your textbook, that's all given in table 4.2. It gives the build number and for the different geometries it gives the values of lambda 1 and A1. 
So that is what we're going to do now. <clears throat> so table 4.1, we're going to see the solution is there. We're going to see it's a cylinder. Okay. Then we're going to make the assumption that tau is larger than 0.2. We don't know if that is going to be the case, but we're going to do the calculation and then we're going to check if it is larger than 0.2. So that is the first thing. And then the other thing is we can look at the solutions for at the center because the temperature of 25 degrees Celsius was measured at the center of the body. So for this case, the solution for a cylinder and take note, there's a zero. The zero indicates at the center. Theta, non-dimensionalized temperature in the center for cylinder. And the equation is the temperature at the center minus T infinite. Ti minus T infinite is equal to A1E to the minus lambda 1 square tau. Okay. You see that? Okay, so we need A1 and lambda 1 to solve tau, because tau is the non-dimensionalized time. That is what we want to determine. Now in table 4.2, we can go and look and see that for this build number that we've calculated of 0.89, And we're going to assume it is approximately 0.9 because there's in, your, in, your, in, table, uh, in the table there's not exact values for 0.9 so we're going to approximate it as approximately 0.1 and at 0.1 we're going to get lambda 1 is equal to 1.2048 and A1 is equal to 1.1902. Okay. For those of you who've got your textbook, please look at it and make sure you get the same value. You just have to be careful. Sometimes you can be in such a rush that if you get the build number there, you use the first two values. But the first two values is for a plain wall. The second two is for the cylinder and the last two is for the sphere. So please make sure you use the column in the center, the two columns in the center. Right, so if we now look at this equation, we're going to do the substitution into the equation. Temperature at the zero is 25. The environment temperature is 20. The initial temperature was 37. T environment is 20. Is equal to a1 is equal to 1.1902 uh, e to the minus 1.2048 square tau and now tau is equal to 0.963 and we are, should be relieved about it because it is larger than 0.2 so our one term assumption is valid. Okay? The non-dimensionalized time is equal to alpha t divided by r0 squared. Alpha is equal to 0.963 is equal to alpha 1.477 multiplied by 10 to the minus mm, uh, minus 7 t divided by the radius the radius is equal to 0.15 square and the result is that t is equal to 146,727 seconds and that is equal to 41 hours ago.
Are you happy with that? You agree? No. No, it's all wrong. It's all wrong. I let you into a trap. It's a trap I've warned you about. <laughs> what is the trap? Yes. Exactly. Yes. So the trap is <laughs> the build number that I took, that we already calculated, is based on the characteristic length, which is only valid for a lump system approach. Well done. So, incorrect. You learn by your mistakes, isn't it? Now let's do it correctly. Okay, so the build number of equal to 0.89 was from the lump system approach. Okay. And in it, the build number is equal to HLC divided by K, and LC, the characteristic length, was determined as the volume divided by the surface area. And this is only valid for lump system approach. So the question is now, all right, I know what's wrong now, but what should I do? <laughs> well, it is very simple. There's no secrets. Okay. And the solution is, and it's unfortunately very small to see on the, on the PowerPoint, but if you go to table 4.2, you're in the fine print. I keep on referring to the fine print. It tells you the build number is equal to HL divided by K, the L would be the half for a plain wall, would be half the, the thickness, because the total thickness is 2L, that was in the, in the boundary conditions, and or HR0 divided by K. And what was R0 when we do the derivation? R0 was half of the diameter. And if you go and look in, in that, then you can see it. For a plain wall, there it is, for, I don't have the cylinder one now, unfortunately, but the cylinder one is equal to R0. So it is all given there. So if you go and look in the fine print, it is equal to H R0 divided by K. So it's table 4.1 in the fine print. So we should have calculated it, it as the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the radius, which is 0.15, 150 millimeters, because the diameter was 300, divided by the thermal conductivity, which is 0.617, and that gives us a totally different build number, 1.944, which is not equal to 0.89. Okay? Right, now, for this build number of 1.9, I'm using 1.9 now because in your table you cannot go to 1.944, but for that build number you will see that lambda 1 is equal to 1.5995 and A1 is equal to 1.3384. Let's go and recalculate from this equation, which is the temperature at the center minus the temperature of the environment, divided by the initial temperature of the body minus the temperature of the environment, is equal to A1 e to the minus lambda square tau, like that. 
<coughs> temperature when it was measured at the time of at a certain time after the murder took place was 25 the environment temperature was 20 the initial temperature of the body was 37 minus the environment temperature is 20 is equal to a1 which is equal to 1.3384 e to the minus 1.5995 square multiplied by the non-dimensionalized time. So the non-dimensionalized time can be solved as 0.6466, okay. which is good news because tau is larger than 0.2. So the one-term assumption is valid. Right, the non-dimensionalized time is equal to alpha t divided by r0 squared. How do I know it? Where do I get it from? Well, again, if you go and look at the table in the fine print, it's, it gives it there, exactly like that. So the non-dimensionalized time is equal to alpha t divided by r0, r0 squared. The non-dimensionalized time is equal to 0.6466. It's equal to alpha, which is 1.477, multiplied by 10 to the minus 7 multiplied by t, divided by 0.15 square, and that gives us a time of 98,517 seconds. If we divide by 3,600 to get it in hours, the actual time of death was 27.37 hours ago. Okay. Right, what would you, if you now look at this problem critically, what would you say are the limitations, things that we haven't taken into consideration? Okay. With this approach that we've used in terms of the cylinder, okay, you have to remember that this paragraph 4.2 Okay. The name of it is transient heat conduction in large plane walls, long cylinders. Okay. So this should be a long cylinder. Therefore, with a very, very long cylinder, if we keep on making it longer and longer and longer, okay, then the error that we're going to make with the heat transfer going out of this surface and this surface will be small in comparison with the total surface area. Now in the case of a body, that is not really the case because we have looked only at the heat transfer rate in one direction. It's a one-dimensional solution. We have not looked at the heat transfer rate in that direction, which means it is a two-dimensional problem. Okay. So, the next paragraph is 4.3, we're not going to do it yet, but in paragraph 4.4, there we're going to look at the three-dimensional solution. And then you'll be able to take into consideration the heat transfer rate from this surface, as well as the heat transfer rate from the other surface also. So it will be even more accurate. Okay. Any questions? I hope that you are now very convinced and very sure about how you should calculate the build number in terms of the characteristic length and which characteristic length you should use. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Then I'll see you again on um, what, Thursday or Friday. Thanks.